I guess it was in 2015, maybe it was 2014. Uh, one Wednesday night, we were on staff here, had been for several years. We pretty much had come to the point where we knew that we were going to be planting a church in Los Angeles soon, but it, we weren't transitioned out yet. Of course, we had no idea the long game that God was playing. We had no clue that we were going to wind up full circle and, and right back in our home church with the honor of leading it. I, I am astounded when I understand the levels on which God plays chess while we all just try to, you know, pick up sticks or whatever. He, he is truly remarkable at what he does. And uh, so we were in that phase, and, and there was a lot going on in our church. Brother Phillips had recently come through cancer. Karen was in the thick of dealing with her battle, and there was just a lot of dynamics going on in the congregation. And we'd kind of been working around the clock, which is to be expected in, in ministry. And and one Wednesday night, Brother Phillips told me, you haven't spent enough time with your family. And I said, well, you know, that time will come again. And he said, no, take your family and go do something with them tonight. Don't be here tonight. And I, that was, a lot of y'all have known Brother Phillips for a long time and you don't believe me. I'm telling you, he did that. He said, do not show up tonight. And uh, so... Eventually, I understood that he was serious, and the circus was in town. So I grew up holy, and so we never did things like that. I wasn't even allowed to go to the carnival. Y'all were all just a bunch of carnal suckers, and we were saved and sanctified. And uh, so I've never been to the circus. I didn't know what to expect. And... Uh, my kids wanted to go, and Brooke did not forewarn me what that den of iniquity is. <laughs> and uh, so it was at the, the Frank Irwin Center, and uh, we, we went. And uh, all I can tell you about the circus is that it was a bizarre experience. That, that I don't really know, I don't even entirely have an opinion on it. <laughs> It just was astoundingly bizarre. It was pretty impressive at points. It absolutely was. Um, I, we, you know, the acrobatics and all that's absolutely astounding. Um, but Cirque du Soleil does exist, and as far as I know, they don't torture animals. So, you know, that, it, that was... And that's where it really hit for us because once they brought out those majestic beasts and began to make them perform, and you, you felt the ferocity of the tension between those great cats and their trainers, and I mean, you felt that killer instinct lurking just below the surface, and they poked and jabbed at them, and, and my kids were horrified. And to be honest with you, so was I. I, I, I don't know... Uh, if, if you love the circus, no judgments here. I think it's just that our generation has grown up with a pretty keen awareness of the impact that human uh, tampering has on the, the, the wild, the nature, what's around us, what God created, and how much damage we tend to do when we try to play God with that stuff. And I know probably a lot, a lot of those animals are rescued and all of that, but it was hard to sit and watch. It just really was. And we can't have been entirely in the minority because that was the emptiest I've ever seen the Frank Irwin Center. There just was almost no one there. And it was very impressive, but it was very off-putting. It was bizarre. Some things were unforgettable for the, all the right reasons, but some things were just, they clashed with, with us. And my kids who, Callista wants to be a vet and that kind of thing, and she was not 
taken with a lot of what went on there that night. And as we left, Brooke and I were weirded out. I'm glad we went because unbeknownst to us, that was one of the very last times that P.T. Barnum and Bailey, the greatest show on earth, would ever perform anywhere. We didn't know that. It's been going for a long time. And for the sake of the grandeur of the history of it and the legend that is around it, I'm glad we got to see it before it went away. And I could tell how remarkable it was. And I know some of y'all are probably a fan of the circus, and I don't blame you. And I think that if I had grown up at a different time, I would have been able to connect to it at, in that way. But as we left, Brooke and I were pretty deep in discussion. This was a strange experience, and why is the room empty? And, and finally, I was able to verbalize it the best way I knew how. I told Brooke, I think the thing is that that's the greatest show in a world that doesn't exist anymore. They're very good at what they do. But what they do doesn't speak into this generation and what's happening in our world right now. And to me, the lesson of that was compelling because I want to be the best at what we're called to do, which is glorify God, love people, reach souls, <laughs> preach the gospel. And I want to make sure that we always posture ourselves in a way that that excellence can be read to the glory of God as what it is by the generation that we're called to. So if the world is changing dramatically, the core of the message never changes, the core of the mission never changes, but our posture as to how we do it has to adjust so that we can reach the generation we've been sent to. And so we got to see one of the very last times that that legendary happening took place. And I don't know whether no one spoke the truth to that company before they failed or whether the truth was spoken to them and they chose to ignore it because when you've been the best at something for a long time, and you've been used to being revolutionary and to people being uncomfortable with what you do and then it working, it can be hard to hear the truth. When, when it's spoken, it can be read as haters or opposition when it might be somebody trying to help you. Remember Solomon said, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Let a righteous man strike me, the psalmist said. It is a kindness. So I don't know what happened. I don't know if, if, if no one ever told them they were out of step or if they refused to listen. But I do know that the truth spoken into that situation and received some years back could have redirected them and they didn't have to go away. They were a legendary organization that turned the world upside down for a long time in marketing and entertainment. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter and the 32nd verse, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It won't just set you free, it will make you free. Did you know when, when the Emancipation Declaration was signed that one of the worst sins of our history was the setting of people free without the making of them free? In other words, we didn't put the tools in people's hands and support them in their journey to living in their freedom. We just said, you're free. And when you are set free, it can be very hard to learn how to live free. Somebody has to care enough 
to see to it that you are made free. Jesus didn't say the truth will set you free. He said it will make you free. It will make you free. So the truth is very important according to scripture. That verse is predicated on verse 31. Jesus is speaking to the believing Jews and he says, if, everybody say if, if, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, actually, the real deal. You're, if you do this, then that is true. If you continue in my word, then you're the real deal. You're actually a disciple. So people, Jesus also said in another place, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is worthy to be called my disciple. So in other words, once you start, it is incumbent upon you to finish in the faith. Paul said to the Galatians, foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? He said, you started out well. You started in grace, and now you think you're going to finish in works? He said, who tricked you? If you continue in my word, you're really my disciples. Jesus there is telling us that his word is the final word on everything. Our qualification as true and genuine disciples of Christ is predicated on how well we live, make our home in, abide, or continue in his word. It is not based on our perfection. Hear me, that's very important. I spoke a few minutes ago about hypocrites being welcome in church. It's not based on our perfection. It's based on our determination to remain faithful to him to the end. We're gonna hold on to Christ Jesus who laid hold of us. So a genuine Christ follower is only at home when they can define the borders of their world by the boundaries of God's word. In other words, if I could put it to you this way this morning, a true Christian, a true Christian has forfeited the right to define right and wrong for themselves, to base their aspirations, their values, their opinions on their own ideas. Our life is not our own. We belong to somebody. We were slaves to sin. Somebody paid the price for our freedom. And now we are in that family and we represent that authority, our life is not our own. So the biblical definition of freedom then, God's take on liberty actually demands the surrender of my self-will to his will. Even Jesus had to wrestle through that. Jesus told the disciples and the, and the Romans and all of them as he neared Calvary, he said, if I wanted to, I could call down 12 legions of angels right now and they'd get me out of this jam. I'm free. I'm free. But in the garden, as he wrestled through the price tag for our freedom, he said, man, if there's some other way we can get this done, Father, I'd really like to do it a different way. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So my will in submission to his will is what freedom looks like to a believer. And that's why the message of Christ is the, the smell of life to those that are being saved, Paul said, but to those that are not, it smells like death. That smells like losing my rights, my liberty. 
But what some of us remember is that when we supposedly had all our rights and all of our self-determination, somehow or other, we found ourselves locked in a cycle we couldn't break no matter what. We found ourselves dependent on crutches that were killing us. We found ourselves leaning on a broken leg in life. We found ourselves slaves to something that we couldn't put our finger on until somebody spoke the truth to us and said, did you know that everyone who's ever been born since Adam and Eve chose rebellion in the garden has been born in sin and formed in iniquity? Did you know that you are not able of your own will to obey God because your very nature is against him and against his law? Do you understand that every human being is born no matter how great they seem, no matter how amazing they may be and how many good works they may do, fundamentally at their core, every human being is in opposition to their creator and fundamentally unable to please him unless and until he, by the graciousness of his Holy Spirit, makes us alive to him and then we die to sin and we are no longer slaves under their sin, but Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. I'm a slave. I'm just a slave to a master I love. That's tough talk. That, that's, that's, there's no way to say that and not feel uncomfortable. The gospel, after all, is a rock of offense. It is. He didn't say you wouldn't be offended. He just said you'd be blessed if you chose not to take offense. Blessed are they that are not offended in me. Thank you for freedom, Jesus. Thank you for freedom. So my opinion has to swear allegiance to his viewpoint. It's not going to take me long today to get through these notes. It's not that they're long. It's that they're hard-hitting. Because they, this makes our flesh uncomfortable. This is, but if, if we're going to talk about freedom today and we're going to talk about liberty, then let's do it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what it means to be a believer and to be free. My right to be self-determined has to be permanently submitted to his right as my creator. He's the potter. I'm the clay. I can't get it twisted. If I do, I will wind up back in the cycle of sin and death that I came from. And there's no there, there. My right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness has to bow before his right to honor and glory, worship and obedience. As a believer, I may be called upon to surrender my rights so that he can be glorified in my suffering. And if I'm called, to, called on to do that, I am biblically instructed to rejoice because I'm counted worthy to suffer for his name. That's real freedom. That's what freedom looks like as a believer. I was sold in sla as a slave under sin had a great talk with a young brother that's been coming to our church for a few weeks this week, and we went to Romans 7. Paul says, I know about the law of, of his grace and mercy and what he's done for me. And he said, but there's this other law that's at work in my body, that the things that I love to do, I don't do, and the things I despise, I do them. And I'm so twisted up. I don't know whether I'm coming or going and how do I get out of this and, and who's going to set me free from this cycle? And he just ends it real simply. Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. That's our way out. That's our freedom. That's our liberty. He paid the price. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Do you know the truth? He said, I am the way, the truth, 
the life. So I'm asking you, do you know the truth? Do you know Jesus? And if you don't even know what that means, then the answer may be not yet. Good news, you're at the right place. He has chosen to reveal himself to us in his word, in the written record that he left us in scripture, in his church, in the faces of our imperfect brothers and sisters who are called upon to represent him in the world, not because of any of their or our righteousness, but because of his righteousness and his goodness and his spirit can live inside of you. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead takes up residence inside of believers and they become regenerated by that. Born again, you've heard it called. Do you know the truth? Do you know Jesus? The truth has made me free from the lie that I had been living when I thought I could make it on my own, when I thought I could achieve the best version of me, live my best life now and all of that. That, that was all a, just a, a bunch of, you know what? But he set me free from that. It didn't feel great. He said things I didn't want to hear. He offended me, he hurt my feelings, but he set me free. I find myself now bound by the truth. I'm free from the lie, but I'm bound by the truth. I can't walk away from it because it has kept me, it has held me. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for my children. I don't own the copyright, the patent, the trademark on truth. The truth isn't mine. Truth belongs to God. Truth will be there if, I, if I'm walking in it and it will still be there if I walk away. Truth remains. Truth matters. Truth comes from God. Truth has a name, Jesus. Psalm 57, verse 10 says, your mercy reaches to the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. It's elevated. It's the, the, that very fact of the divine source of truth that makes it such a priceless treasure that's worth pursuing at any cost. It's because it comes from God, it belongs to God, it goes to God is God. To find the truth is to find God. And to know God is to know the truth. Proverbs 23 and 23 says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. For the next several weeks, we're going to be focusing on our summer sermon series. Not every week. Uh, in the middle of all this, other things may happen from time to time. One thing that I'm extremely excited about is I believe it's on the 17th, right? Yes, yeah, Stephanie Haney Montez, our very own women's leader and Asbel and Stephanie have been an amazing, amazing asset. It's they were sent here on assignment by God to see us through this moment of transition. And so Stephanie Haney Montez has a word from God and she's going to bring it to us in the middle of all of this. And she'll have the book that she's just released um, available and, and we want to buy as many copies as we can. I want to see uh, that book put on the bestseller list. You know why? Not so that she can be glorified. That's not her motive either. But there is so much worthless junk on that list. So why not ask the Lord to help us put something worth having on that list? So we'll have that, maybe some other things here and there. But for the next several weeks, we're focusing on a series that I'm calling No Cap. And, and I'm, I, here's the deal. 
if, if, if the world is going to push a narrative, if culture is going to push a narrative, if they're going to try to convince us of their way of looking at things, then I think God should have an opportunity to say his peace. And, and here's the deal. He has in his word, but increasingly folks feel the need to skirt around the truth that he left us in his word for fear of offending uh, culture and and Christianity light, this whole cultural Christianity thing we've gotten into that looks so pretty on a coffee mug but has so little to offer you at midnight when your baby's in ICU and your, your husband's on, on 6th Street trying to, to get to the bottom of his problems in, in a way that is not going to be productive and, and your mother-in-law is going at it with you and, and, and Hobby Lobby's a great place, y'all. I'm sorry I pick on it. It's either that or Chick-fil-A. Those are wonderful places, but let me tell you something. You better hope your faith goes deep deeper than something you can wear on a t-shirt when you need him in the midnight hour. And there is so much of a cultural mythology that we've built around the faith. And some of it's just flat not true. I mean, stuff your mama told you that's ridiculous. God doesn't help those who help themselves. He waits until they're done being their own worst enemy, and then whatever pickle they've gotten themselves in, he saves them, he helps them, he heals them and delivers them. Let me tell you something else, and this will come up later in the series too. God does absolutely put more on you than you can bear. I don't know who told you that he doesn't, but he does and he will. Yes, he will. No cap, he will. No cap just means I'm not lying. Some of y'all know. For, I, I, said, I, I said I'm not going to explain it for a while just because I'm going to let the folks that know get a kick out of the fact that the other folks don't know. But it just means I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. No cap. God will put more on you than you can bear so that, like Jesus in the garden, you may fall down on your knees and say, you're going to have to get me through this. I need you. I need you. I can't make it another minute without you because his objective is to be one with you. He wants unity with you. He wants you and him to be on the same page. He wants you to find your identity in him. So he will mess with you and mess you up until you hit that place because he loves you. So that's going to be our summer series because God's truth is greater than my truth. Now that's where I'm, I'm, now that is crossing the line from preaching into meddling. And, and now we're using no cap. The young folks have no idea what I mean when I say that's meddling. That's meddling just means that you, you, you folks are going to get mad. It just means that some folks are not gonna like to hear this because it's countercultural, because Jesus is subversive, because somehow all through human history, no matter how creative, how revolutionary, how spectacular a culture may be that emerges, somehow the gospel is always contrary to culture. They can't be that different than each other because somehow they always run afoul of the gospel and the gospel always runs afoul of culture. So let me tell you something about your truth. Okay? Let me tell you something about your truth. Your truth would have come in handy during the toilet paper crisis. I know, I know your truth is so important. I just need to tell you my truth. I get it. I hear you, I hear you. Listen, when you're done with your truth, when, you've done, when you're done saying whatever you need to say to make you feel the way you need to feel to get through the day, just remember this one thing. 
If your truth is in opposition to his truth, then one day your truth will bow its knee to him and proclaim that he is Lord. God's truth is greater than my truth. No cap. God's mercy and his truth are directly related. Directly related. The psalmist said, your mercy reaches to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. It could be said that his truth is his mercy. Because the highest cruelty imaginable would be for the only being who can save us from the lies we tell ourselves, because we all tell ourselves a narrative just to get through another day. We do. I have to tell myself a narrative just to get out of bed in the morning. I mean, we all tell ourselves the stories we need to hear. And somehow, we're almost all of us are always either the, the, uh, the uh, victim or the hero in our own story. But you know something that you need to hear this morning? You are the villain in somebody's story. And then I'm not the first person who said that because it's true. You are the villain in somebody's story. I am too. And you know what? Some of them are dead wrong. Their truth is ridiculous. Some of them are right. I messed up. I failed them. I did wrong. But I see that story a little differently than they see it. And the way I see it, my truth and their truth, none of that really matters in the light of his truth. And so the highest cruelty we could imagine is for the only being who can save us from the lie that we tell ourselves in order to justify the evil in our hearts to allow us to continue to live in those lies unchallenged by the truth. That, that would be like if your, your mother or your dad when you were a little baby saw you running into the road and just said, well, it makes her really happy. Mm -hmm. My truth is that I should be able to play anywhere I want. Oh, that's sweet, baby. It's so important for you to live in your truth. Yeah, yeah. Until, until it's not. Until it doesn't matter anymore. Brendan is offended that I won't allow him to poke a screwdriver in the wall socket. His parents and his other family let him do it all the time before we were born. He's convinced that he was an electrician in that life and he knows how to handle himself around electric out outlets. That's, that's his truth. Brendan really, really believes that he knows exactly what to do. My truth, on the other hand, is that his truth is stupid. And, and how cruel would I be as his dad if I allowed him to continue in his truth unchallenged, knowing that the truth can free him from mortal danger? I will tell you, I'm not above the fatherly uh, impulse to occasionally, you know, let him lick the electric fence if he really wants to. I mean... I'll bring him clean britches. I get that. And you know what? God gets that too. Sometimes when we're so bent out of shape about needing to tell our truth, he goes, all right. Yeah, you, you do that. I'll be here. I got the band-aids nearby. You'll live. You'll live. But one of these days you're going to realize that my truth is better than your truth. No cap. We want to use this series as an opportunity to just present the gospel to our friends, our neighbors, our relatives. I know we can be a little crazy in this church. We know that. We've, we've been doing our part to keep Austin weird for a long time. And we aim to continue that trend well into the future. That's, that's God's gift to promised land as we get to be those people. And, and I'm, I'm happy about that. And I know last week, if, you, if you'd been here last week, 
and you'd never been in a spirit-filled or Pentecostal service, or maybe even if you had, you, you might have had questions. It was crazy. It was absolutely a, a, what we call a Holy Ghost meltdown, and I love it, and I want to see those happen. But I also, when we're doing a push to bring in your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, your coworkers, I want you to know that our focus right now is on these powerful, liberating truths of God's Word that dispel the fog of, of, of Christianese mythology and, and actually set the record straight for our world on just exactly what is on offer through Jesus Christ. So that's why we're doing this. That's why we're talking about this stuff. And, and it, it matters because he said it matters. Mercy and truth have a close relationship. When I confront Brendan with the truth against his truth, that's mercy. His mercy and his truth. That's why truth is not a commodity to be traded for profit. It's a costly treasure. It's cost a lot of people something. It costs Jesus everything. It's a costly treasure to be handed down once, once procured, once you've found it, buy the truth and sell it not. It becomes a family heirloom handed down from generation to generation. And the worst tragedy is when it skips a generation and we beg God, please bring them back. And he does, in his mercy, bring them back to his truth so often and it matters and we want to see it preserved the value of truth is directly related to its rarity its purity the cost of mining it from out of all of the junk around it and its durability truth doesn't rust it shines it goes out of fashion but it never, ever, ever expires. Truth never corrodes. It withstands every environmental condition. Truth doesn't yield. It can't be shaped or formed or worked over or made more consumable. You can't buff the rough edges away. Truth is what it is. Like it or lump it, take it or leave it. Truth is not a stone to be cut and worn as adornment to make you look good. It's a rock to plant your feet on when the quicksand of culture and opinion threaten to swallow you up when you're suffocating in peer pressure and identity crisis. No cap. A lot is made in culture today of one's own truth, my truth, your truth. But even Urban Dictionary knows it's a crock. I was so tickled when the top definition in Urban Dictionary of my truth, <laughs> pretentious substitute for non-negotiable personal opinion. How great is that? I mean, how great is that? God bless whoever wrote that definition. I love this, often used by academics, a convenient phrase for avoiding arguments because people can contradict your opinion, but not your truth. Let me tell you something about your truth. I'll argue it and I'll argue your mama because I represent a greater truth. I represent the truth. I represent help. If you're sinking, you should talk to me because I know somebody you need to meet. And then how about that last line? The phrase is often used when seeking to justify 
a controversial personal stance or action because people are not allowed to argue with your truth. And where they put controversial personal opinion, read manifestly stupid idea. I mean, people say things and you go, no, there's no way that's, nope, no. Ice does not freeze at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. No. No matter what your truth is, it's not, it's not a controversial opinion. It's, it's downright stupid. It's a lie. But once somebody says it's my truth, we all have to back slowly away. Psalm 11 for look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows. Shoot from the shadows. In Hebrew, that, that says from the dusk, like, like nightfall, from the gray area. Wickedness will shoot its arrow at you from the gray areas. At the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the answer is this. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. Let me break that down as I, as I wind around the corner to my clothes right now. I, I, I just want you to understand what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, hey, there's a lot of poison that wants to try to shoot at you from the shadowy parts of your life where it's hard to define the difference between light and dark and right and wrong and you can lose sight. More accidents happen at dusk than at any other time of the day because it's just light enough that you don't realize that you can't see because of all the darkness around you and, and you lose your depth perception and, and so the, the arrows of the wicked come at you out of those places in your life but the psalmist said uh, and when it feels like the foundations being destroyed what can the righteous do well David said it in another place this way when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock lead me to the rock that is higher than I what the psalmist said right here is what the righteous can do is he said hey God has not changed his address he has not even moved around the block he is right where you left him. His righteousness is from age to age. His loving kindness is forever. His mercy endures from generation to generation. And his truth will make you free. The enemy of your soul capitalizes on the gray areas where light has been muddied by society and culture and experience to sling his arrows of doubt at your faith. When God's people find themselves on a shaky foundation in danger of falling, no wonder the God of this world has made such a point to convince us all to treat truth as relative, subjective, and personal. Because all great manipulations are built all great illusions are built on the manipulation of personal perception. How does the magician control you? By making you look at what he wants you to look at and ignore what he wants you to ignore. It's called sleight of hand. It's all about perception. And so you experience a reality that's not real. Let me close by taking you back to the circus. There's a great channel on YouTube called Thoughty2, T-H-O-U-G-H-T-Y-2, not the other kind of thought. It has a great video out about the Barnum effect that in psychology, it occurs when individuals believe that phrases apply to them specifically some of y'all are way too young to remember this, but there used to be a guy called John Edwards who had a show called Crossing Over, but you've probably seen Madam Whoever, some kind of a psychic or a medium. 
somebody, a charlatan parading as a prophet who will come and, and read the room, do a cold reading or a warm reading. And what they do is they start throwing out phrases like, I sense that you're somebody that, that really cares what people think about them. I sense that you're somebody that feels the need to stand up for what's right. Sometimes you struggle with it and you beat yourself up about that. I sense that you really want to do something meaningful with your life. And, and they watch the room as they're going for the people that are really buying it. Oh, yeah, that's me. That's me. And then they add a little something in. I'm getting an M over here. Is there a female family member with an M that, oh, yeah, she's coming through real strong. She wants you to know. It's never she wants you to know that she left the stove on. It's always she wants you to know she's just fine. Everything's just peachy whatever. Those phrases, those are called the Barnum effect. Those are Barnum phrases. Because of our ego and because of our narcissistic impulses as humans, we read those as, that's me. That's why you see people doing all those stupid quizzes on social media. Let me tell you something. They didn't just get your name and find out all this stuff about you. You're just kind of basic they just took a shot in the dark and got it right. You're just like all the rest of us. But for the privilege of them telling you how amazing you are and how wonderful you are, you gave them all your personal information and now you want to get mad when Alexa personalizes your ads. Quit taking the stupid quizzes. They know a lot about you because you're human. And so those, the Barnum effect is when people buy into believing that something is really real because you said something that sounded like it was all about me, but it's not. It's just all about all of us. It's just an understanding of human nature. And I might begin next week, God willing, with a story about one of Barnum's first great public scams. And I think it's a riveting story and I'd like to share it with you and I think it would be a great place to pick up maybe next week or maybe a week or two down the line depending on where it comes from. But, but let me just say about this that the enemy and culture and your mama have all lied to you and made you think you were just that special, that you're just, all these amazing things are true about you. And let me tell you something, they're true about you because you're made in the image of God. That's the best in you. That's, that's what he sees that makes him wanna redeem you and save you and set you on it. Cause he looks at you and he sees himself because he put a lot of himself in you. And, but they don't mean that you're so special that, that, that unlike the, you know, the, the Lord said through the prophet Jeremiah that the sin of my people is written with a pen of iron, with the point of a diamond. It's engraved on the tablet of their heart. That's preaching that you don't hear much anymore, isn't it? On the altars, on the horns of your altars, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked but your grandma wants you to follow your heart but God says who can know your heart he said only me I the Lord search the heart I test the mind I give to everyone according to their ways Romans 3 says indeed let God be true in every human being a liar as it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged at it as it is written there is none righteous no not one there is none who understands how many are there who are righteous how many are there who understand what God wants from them no one there is none who seeks after God they have all turned aside they have together Together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And the only exception to that rule is Jesus Christ 
who was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died so that you and I could find freedom and healing and salvation. He was buried in the ground for three days. He descended into the depths and he grabbed the keys of hell and death. And by the time he got up on the third day, Satan didn't even know that he was locked out of his own house and he can no longer control and manipulate anyone who is in Christ, a new creation. That's the good news, no cap. Jesus Christ has paid the price for your salvation. Are you strung out on something this morning? He will set you free. Are you addicted to pornography? He loves you and he's gonna help you. But unlike your mama, he won't tell you it's okay because you're so wonderful. No cap, you're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. But Jesus Christ has paid the price for your salvation. Don't leave without that gift. Don't leave without that gift. Y'all excited about this series? Start thinking who in, my, who in my circle needs to come and hear just the plain, simple gospel of Jesus? Who in my circle really needs to hear this simple offer we have? This is all we've got, folks. This is as good as it gets. We may get a, a nicer Sunday school room someday, but the message won't improve. We may get a cooler screen someday. I want one of those LED walls, but that won't make the message any better. We'll just look a little better delivering it and you'll be able to see our acne up close. The message of Jesus Christ is timeless. It is ageless. It is eternal. It is the truth. It does not fail. And if you have never received that this morning, then I would like to make this offer as we close. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads because I don't want anyone to feel like they're being watched. I'm looking, but I really need everyone else to just put your head down so no one feels watched. If you haven't taken advantage of that offer, if you feel a tug on your heart this morning, I understand that my truth has to bow before his truth, and the truth is I've been trying to make it on my own, and I need a Savior. Would you slip your hand up in the air? We won't embarrass you. What are we going to do? We're going to pray with you. Just thank you. 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 What about those of you that need to rededicate? Maybe you should slip a hand up too. I, you know what? I was letting the enemy lie to me, but no cap. I'm coming home right now. I'm going to quit playing games with my soul's salvation. I'm going to follow Jesus because he loved me first. I can love him back. Would you pray with me right now? Let's say, Father, in the name of Jesus. I am so thankful that you have made a way for me to escape, for me to escape the world, the enemy of my soul, darkness, self, deceit, sin. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that I ever thought I could make it without you but I surrender. Be my Lord. I thank you that you died for me. And I thank you that you rose again for me. I want to be filled with your spirit. So I surrender. Empty me of me. Come inside. Fill me up. Send me to go help somebody that needs to hear this truth. Now say this with me, say, Satan, I don't belong to you anymore. I belong to Jesus. Say this again, say, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The blood of Jesus, the word of God, the name of Jesus says you're a liar and you are a trespasser. You have to get your hands off of my mind my body, my soul, my family, my resources, 
I'm taking it all back in the name of Jesus. Now somebody that believes that these souls have taken the first step, shout to the Lord if you want to be filled with the baptism.